Welcome to Postcards, a brief look at people, places, the arts and curiosities from around the world. On today's program, Oscars for the Philatelic World, the Roland Hill Awards. An exhibition pays tribute to the artists and designers who transform imagination into reality. Faith and Community, our feature looks at how we adapt in our multicultural societies. Man-made wetlands are creating a huge magnet for wildlife, especially wild birds. And finally, an exhibition of rare sketches and paintings of wildlife by William McGillray. First up, 60 years ago and alarm bells rang all over England. For these young pilots it was to be their finest hour as they took to the sky to attack Nazi Germany's bombers in the heroic Battle of Britain. Today a whole new generation has grown up knowing little of the contribution of the few. A new £100,000 or $160,000 US permanent exhibition at the Royal Air Force Museum in northwest London aims to rectify that. Our finest hour tells the story of what's been called the greatest battle in the history of warfare. the opening, more than 25 of Britain's wartime fighter pilots gathered to relive their hard-won glory. Among them, Group Captain John Catsai Cunningham, the highest scoring night fighter ace of the war. A total of 520 pilots paid the ultimate price. Life expectancy for these young pilots was low. A total of 915 Royal Air Force fighter planes were destroyed and 358 pilots were wounded. Nazi Germany's Luftwaffe lost 1,733 aircraft, mostly bombers. The slumbering aircraft have been brought back to life in the exhibition and include all the main players' planes, like the Spitfires and Germany's Messerschmitts. Our finest hour has already opened to an avid public and is just part of a wider program of expansion at the RAF Museum over the coming months. Winston Churchill, some say the architect of victory, his statue broods over Parliament Square. And his spirit is captured in this new exhibition at a gallery in the West End. Churchill is a parliamentary colossus watercolour drawing which appeared in magazine The Tatler. And George Barber painted this in 1943, when Churchill was at the height of his wartime premiership. This highly skilled portrait by Hitchcock was painted towards the end of Churchill's life. A sketch by Topolsky. And this cartoon showing Churchill as a Breton fisherman, probably an allusion to his attempts to rally the French forces. It's a mark of his public esteem that his image was reproduced everywhere on hundreds of household items. And Churchill's undoubted skills as a painter are also displayed here. This sunlit view of Khan Harbour captures his delight in colour and the texture of paint. The exhibition shows many unusual facets of Britain's best-known wartime leader at all stages of his life and recalls the time when so much was owed by so many to so few. The Roland Hill Awards, named after the man who invented adhesive stamps, have been described as the Oscars for the philatelic world. This year's awards were no less prestigious, with collectors, dealers and a veritable who's who of the philatelic world at the Palace of Whitehall. Britain's veteran Labour MP Tony Benn was a fitting guest presenter. As Britain's Postmaster General from 1964 to 66, he was responsible for commissioning Royal Mail specialist stamps 
and finding the man who would become Britain's most prolific stamp designer, David Gentleman. Artist David Gentleman was in his 30s when he first took on the role of stamp designing for the Queen. He was honoured with a prestigious award for outstanding contribution to the philatelic world. He says the biggest challenge in stamp designing is to convey a complex idea in a very small space. David Gentleman's 103 stamps have included commemorative work for the Battle of Hastings anniversary, the death of Winston Churchill and a Shakespeare tribute. The Bard and Churchill are the only two commoners to have appeared on a stamp alongside royalty. In the 60s, David made a bold push to remove the monarch's head from the stamp in the name of better design. He believes we'd have had better looking and simpler stamps without it. But he's pleased that the then Postmaster General Tony Benn fell on deaf ears. And not surprisingly, the palace preferred it to remain. His most recent work was a challenging depiction of the abstract notion of time to celebrate the millennium. Gentlemen wanted to incorporate Harrison's measuring instruments to encapsulate the history of timekeeping. The spaceships, creatures and landscapes of the Star Wars universe as seen in their latest manifestation, Episode 1, The Phantom Menace, all began life in the imagination of creator George Lucas. A new exhibition at the Barbican Centre in London pays tribute to the artists and designers who transform imagination into reality, displaying for the first time ever the models, drawings and costumes they've created. A special installation focuses on the dark side of the Force. Darth Vader has his own grotto. Curator of the exhibition, Mark Sladen, says the craftsmanship in the displayed objects warrants their inclusion in a gallery context. The process starts with concept artists and designers who visualise the ideas of George Lucas, putting them down on paper for the first time. The exhibition charts their progress from the original drawings to the extraordinary three-dimensional models. One of the three central characters of the Star Wars saga is C-3PO, whose fiberglass costume was sculpted around actor Anthony Daniels. One room boasts a full-scale version of Anakin Skywalker's pod racer suspended from the ceiling. It's a gallery devoted to the role of the model maker, like Lorne Peterson, whose more old-fashioned skills complement those of their colleagues in the computer graphics department. There's plenty of reassurance here for technophobes that no matter how much computer animation there is in a film, traditional skills are still needed to achieve the final result. The exhibition's organisers say the objects displayed here should be taken seriously. They represent the visual culture of the Star Wars movies, the world's most successful series of films. One thousand years ago, the Christian faith was at the heart of daily life in England. Britain was just part of a Christendom that stretched across Europe. The church's influence shaped millions of lives, inspired masterpieces and coursed through the veins of Europe's expanding empires. But by the 19th century, the certainties of Christianity were faltering. Charles Darwin's series of evolution dethroned the biblical story of creation and religion was denounced by Karl Marx as the opiate of the masses. Today, Christianity is much less of a force in the secular new millennium. With Britain's multicultural population, other religions like Judaism, Hinduism and Islam are playing a deepening role in British society. Church congregations, it seems, are dwindling. With fewer than a million Anglicans now regularly attending Sunday services, many churches are closing, being sold or finding other uses. In the West Midlands city of Coventry, St Barnabas' Anglican Church is facing closure. The church serves a small parish of around 2,500 people. 40% are of other faith communities, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs and Irish Catholics. With only 13 to 15 parishioners attending each Sunday morning and no weddings in the last 10 years, the Reverend feels they're not serving the community and the church should close down. St Barnabas's Family Centre will take over the church when it closes next year. It will serve the races and religions of the entire city of Coventry.
Vicar Reverend Lydia Humphreys of St Margaret's in Coventry has had to be more flexible in her church, allowing it to be used by the community for activities other than worship. She's content the church is at least drawing the community towards it and providing opportunities for the youth of the parish. With a congregation of only around 50 people, St Peter's Church in Coventry will close later this year. The upkeep and maintenance costs on the building are enormous. Despite the problems, the spiritual leader of the Church of England believes faith is still at the heart of the British nation. The Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, believes there is still a hunger for God in the lives of very secular people. Some of that ground is being made up in the evangelical churches. With the emphasis on song and modern music, congregations are growing again, with more young people being attracted into the church. This strain and a radical new thinking may revitalise and save Christianity. The Archbishop of Wales, Dr Rowan Williams, doesn't believe we can call Britain a Christian country now. His views are borne out in the obvious influence that religions like Islam are having in society. Most British cities now have a mosque. Britain's oldest purpose-built mosque, the Shah Jahan Mosque, has stood in Woking, Surrey, since 1889. Immigration and conversions to Islam have swelled the numbers of British Muslims to some two million. New mosques, like Edinburgh's King Fahad Mosque, are being built to accommodate worshippers of this, the fastest growing religion in the UK. Since the opening ceremony two months ago, the mosque has welcomed 10 new converts to Islam. Hundreds of British Muslims make the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca every year. But for the first time this year, a temporary British consulate has been established in Mecca, so British pilgrims can use its consular and medical services. Islamic culture is becoming an increasingly familiar part of British life. At the Islamic High School for Girls, the national curriculum is supplemented with lessons in the Quran and in Arabic. It serves halal food in the school canteen and the hijab is part of the school uniform. A stalwart of the music scene for 40 years, double bass player Danny Thompson converted to Islam when he felt the spiritual dimension missing from his life. Religion is often about what sits right within oneself. Growing numbers of young Britons are turning away from established religions and towards the faiths of the original inhabitants of this country. The pagan beliefs centre around the masculine and feminine spiritual energies which make up the universe. The Druids, here preparing to celebrate the autumn equinox, say their faith rests on honouring nature within the human soul. The aptly named Holy Island off Scotland's west coast has been a sacred site since pre-Christian times. The Celtic missionary, Saint Molaise, lived as a hermit in this island cave. Christianity came here in the 6th century 
and by the 13th century, the island was home to a small monastic community. Now, the island is about to become an important centre for Buddhism. It's been bought by the Same Ling, the first and largest Tibetan Buddhist centre in Europe. Its base in mainland Scotland's border country was founded more than three decades ago by refugees from Tibet. Volunteers are building a $9 million US Buddhist retreat centre on Holy Island. Buddhism won't be the only presence here either. On the north of the island, an international multi-faith centre is being built for all devotees to share. It should ensure that a place of Christian beginnings continues to have a spiritual significance well into the 21st century. With more than 105 acres of lakes, ponds and marshes, this is the largest urban wetland centre in Europe. Opened this week by wildlife enthusiast Sir David Attenborough, the man-made wetlands close to the centre of London are already creating a huge magnet for wildlife, especially wild birds. Attenborough said it's animals in the natural world living in close harmony with people living in cities. That's a great boon. This environmental project, the only one of its kind in any capital city in the world, has been designed specifically to encourage birds to feed, roost and breed, including species which are rare and endangered in southern England. But to do this, environmentalists have had to create differing habitats within the one area, everything from open water lakes to grasslands and mudflats. They've recreated habitats from all over the world, from a white water stream in New Zealand to a tropical swamp in Southeast Asia. What would take visitors a round world trip of 35,000 miles they can now see in about five minutes here. The centre has been designed in such a way that bird watchers can walk in between each area without disturbing nesting birds. And coupled with the visitors centre, it's hoped people will not only observe the birds but also learn more about their environment. The former reservoir site owned by the water utility Thames Water has become redundant and the company, who wished to use the land sympathetically, agreed to this project. It's now hoped other countries around the world will introduce similar projects in larger cities in hope that more wild bird species can be protected and humans can learn to live in better harmony with nature. For many children living in inner London, this is school, a legacy of an austere Victorian age. For many Bosnian youngsters, there's an ever-present legacy of a different kind, of war. Consider then putting some of each into the shadowy world of a Kent forest in the southeast of England. No school books, pencil or rulers here, just the reality of survival and getting on with one another. And the faces reveal the complex challenges facing these youngsters children who clearly personify the multicultural mix of today's Britain. This adventurous shift in the educational process is a result of a unique program worked out by the Lambeth Education Authority and the Forestry Commission. And that's what it's all about. But team building can be a difficult process, especially when it comes to finding the best materials for a forest shelter. Few of these children will ever have to survive in a forest, fending for themselves in the provision of food or shelter. But that doesn't mean the exercise of creating their own shelter doesn't have important educational and social dimensions.
close up contact too with the creatures of the forest, although not always friendly ones. Even the Bosnian youngsters, on holiday in Britain and with a limited knowledge of the English language, proved the equal of their homegrown peers when it came to woodland skills. Education officer Nadine Thomas says the children learn how to communicate and cooperate with each other. They learn that within the group, you don't just need the doers, you need the actual thinkers as well. It must have seemed a long way from the regime of the classroom, from arithmetic, from spelling, and maybe most importantly of all, from the company of everyday friends. But even for these now qualified woodlanders, the necessary benefits of civilization still have their place. The Natural History Museum is renowned for its displays and exhibitions of the world's flora and fauna. But even with this vast space, the museum cannot display all the treasures it holds in its vaults. Going on public show for the first time ever, are 60 rare sketches and paintings of wildlife by the Scottish naturalist William McGilvray. These works, painted over a century and a half ago, illustrate McGilvray's ability to combine a naturalist's eye for detail with an artist's sensibility. Plus one other particular characteristic, respect for the wildlife itself. William McGilvray was a prolific writer and academic, as well as a working field naturalist and painter. But though a respected university professor and public lecturer, this humble, straight-talking Scot remained outside the tight-knit academic establishment of the age. William McGilvray was a friend of the now famous wildlife painter John Audubon. Audubon's works now fetch big prices at auction, but few people had even heard of McGilvray, though the two worked closely together for 10 years, and according to his biographer, McGilvray was at least the equal of his more famous American contemporary. It is said that Audubon taught McGilvray how to paint, and McGilvray taught Audubon how to be a scientist. After this exhibition, the public will at last be able to judge McGilvray's output for themselves. And the curators say this show is just the beginning of a series brushing the dust off some of the many treasures long buried in the museum's vast archives. And that's all for today. Join us again next time for a postcard look at interesting people, places, the arts and curiosities.